I'm going to talk about uh, data problems and biology and interesting things that uh, I think about. And uh, I'll try to make this as um, kind of interesting as possible and then do a lot of QA. How many people in here think of themselves as a computational biologist? Wow, OK. <laughs> Where'd you get these guys, Paul? <laughs> OK, well, all right. This is going to be fun. OK, so what's this? Anybody have an idea what this is? This is what biological data looked like in Darwin's time, right? <laughs> this is a page out of Darwin's notebook. Um, and as you can tell, he had excellent handwriting. <laughs> uh, he was probably writing it on a boat, you know, on the Beagle as it was moving around. Um, but this is how biological data used to be uh, collected. And it accumulated at a, a great uh, you know, rate. You could measure it in inches per year, probably. Um, now, of course, uh, biological data is growing faster than Moore's law. Okay, so this is an interesting uh, plot because it has uh, three things that are essential towards understanding modern, uh, modern biology all in one chart. Okay, so the and sorry it's so small because I wasn't tending to spend time on this too much. But the blue line, the light blue line that goes up fast, uh, starting around 2007, is the rate at which we're producing uh, genome sequences. Okay. The pink line is the rate at which you know, processes are getting faster, which essentially has stopped, right? Um, not the, not the uh, rate at which we can build you know, parallel machines, but the rate of individual processors. And the um, uh, yellow line is sort of you know, hard disk storage, right? So if this actually continued for like a long time, this would be a problem, because it means that we're generating data at a rate faster than we're sort of uh, building storage devices, but of course, this is not taking into account parallelism, but what it means is that even if you're a lowly biologist, okay, and you want to do next generation sequencing, you've got to do parallel computing because you're generating data faster than the individual components are improving in computing systems. Okay? And of course, the rate at which the total amount of data being produced in biology is, is going exponentially uh, fast. Um, in your lifetime, I'm sure all of you will be sequenced probably more than once because the sequencing technology will keep getting better and cheaper. So the first time that you get sequenced, how many of you have had 23andMe? Okay, one, wow, one, two, all right, three or four brave souls, all right? Eventually, it'll, right now, at 100 bucks, whatever, it's, they're doing uh, chip sequence, chip-based sequencing. So they're just looking for uh, those parts of the genome that they know have variation in it. In a few years, be a couple hundred bucks, you can get your entire genome sequence. A few years after that, it'll be like a routine thing, like when you go and get an x-ray, right? They're like, well, when was the last time you had an x-ray? Oh, a couple years ago. Okay, we'll take another one. Right, when was the last time you had a genome sequence? I'll take another one, right? Because it'll be a little bit better, right? And I'll talk about what we'll do with all that data in a minute. But um, I think that will happen. If you come back here 10 years from now, we can have a discussion about, about that. There are many projects around the world right now that are t attempting to systematically sequence big parts of biology that we're interested in. Uh, the top one um, is a million plant and animal genomes project. So this, all three of these are uh, from a company in China called BGI that used to be, uh, BGI used to be the Beijing Genomics Institute and about four years ago, it became a private company with a lot of money invested by the Chinese government to try to be the world's largest accumulator of, of, of uh, economically valuable sequence data. Okay, so they've launched a ton of projects, but here's three of their projects they've launched. They're going to sequence a million uh, plant and animal genomes. Okay, there's about less than a thousand species of plants and animals that are actually highly economically valuable. So they're going to sequence, of course, all of those species and then many variations of each of those species, right? So this is not necessarily a million different plants. It's sequencing a million plant genomes, which might be just a thousand types sequenced a thousand times so you can understand the breadth of variation. Humans, okay, a million human genomes. Right now there's about somewhere around 30,000 human genomes that have been completely sequenced. Um, this number is increasing pretty rapidly, but they're going to go after a million in a coordinated study. Um, and a million what they call microsystem, microecosystem genome project. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. This is basically sequencing environments, like your gut or soil or 
the microbiome of a coral reef, for example. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk first about microbes. So this is a, one of my favorite microbes. This is a cyanobacteria. How many guys? There's no biology people here, so maybe you don't know what this is. This is the kind of thing that built the atmosphere of the planet. It's a cyanobacteria. It's um, not a plant or an animal. It's a bacterium, but it's a photosynthetic organism. These uh, little uh, blobs in here are the precursors to chloroplasts that were in plants. They actually evolved in cyanobacteria first and then hopped over into plants uh, a couple hundred million years ago. Um, this, this type of organism has been on the planet for oh, a couple billion years. In the first about billion years, all it had to do was sit there and uh, grow, and its byproduct was oxygen. So the atmosphere, which was reduced, was, you know, didn't have a lot of oxygen, essentially no oxygen initially, became enriched in oxygen due to these organisms. And in fact, about half of the total photosynthetic output on the planet comes from these kinds of organisms in the, in the um, uh, pelagic ocean, okay, far from shore. Um, it's about, oh, maybe a micron across. It has about 3,000 genes, okay, 3,000 different parts, type, part types. And uh, there's uh, probably, a, I don't know, something like 10,000 different kinds of this guy, okay. Now, sequencing. In order to study things like this, we want to decode its genome because the genome is coding for all these 3,000 proteins, 3,000 parts in this organism. You have about 10 times that many proteins, only 10 times as much. So even though this thing is only a couple microns big and you're, I don't know, a meter and a half big, you only have about 10 times as much uh, genetic complexity as the bacteria. Now, Next generation sequencing is all about what's powering this growth curve in sequencing. And the idea here uh, is pretty simple, um, where you essentially extract the, the DNA from the organism, you grind them up, literally, in blenders, okay? Separate, you put them in a centrifuge, separates it by mass, you put some salt solution in there. The DNA uh, is about the same density as salt solution, you can dial that in. You produce a layer, you extract the DNA, some alcohol, pull it out. Um, uh, you put it in another kind of blender called a shearer. You can do all kinds of ways with this, but it breaks it up into small fragments. You then pour it into a, a, into a little container, essentially, lots, with thousands of little cells, millions of little cells. And there's some chemical reactions that will systematically, essentially, read off the base pairs in each of these millions of cells. And at every cycle where it reads off one base pair, there's an image taken of these millions of cells in each of four colors, right? One for each of the different base pairs. And so DNA sequence starts out as a stack of images, very high resolution images, uh, kind of, I don't know, 20 megapixel kind of images which are then image processed to produce a linear sequence in each of the cells that translates into what we call a read. A read is a short piece of, of DNA, reconstructed DNA, that's typically about 100 to 200 base pairs long. And that's the starting point for all the analysis that we're talking about, okay? Now, the problem is that you went from this organism that had a fully functional chromosome, maybe some plasmids, it was bacteria, lots of chromosomes, it was like, like one of us, and we end up with um, a whole bunch of little fragments all over the proverbial floor, right? Those of you, most of you weren't around during this time, but Paul remembers like when the um, uh, American embassy in Tehran was taken over and uh, the Americans in the embassy had been shredding documents like crazy, right? Everything was still on paper back then, uh, but they didn't have time to uh, incinerate it all before they had to leave the embassy. So when the Iranian students came in there, the floor was covered with stuff like this, and they had hundreds of students sitting there with little cardboard things, just like this, with rubber bands on them, reassembling the classified documents, okay? Those were the first genome assemblers. <laughs> now our challenge is to, do, of course, do this more quickly, but to start with these short reads and actually use uh, cleverness and algorithms to re recover, reconstruct the big linear sequence. And the way that we do this, um, there's many optimized 
or non-optimized algorithms for doing this assembly problem. This is what it's called. And I, I talked to you about, you know, finding these fragments, but in fact, we can do clever things in the chemistry to make sequences that go into the sequencer have um, essentially read across big gaps, okay? So we have part of the sequence from, say, over here, and then a couple thousand base pairs that we don't actually read, another piece of sequence over here. And so we can create what we call paired ends. And paired ends are something like this. So this is the 200 base pair, 100 base pair, 100 base pair with a more or less known gap in between them. And we want that because DNA is highly repetitive. And repeats, particularly in things like humans, can be quite long, much longer than the ability for us to actually read the sequence. So if we want to assemble this in some non ambiguous way, we actually have to take advantage of the fact that we have these paired ends that span some distance and it allows us to essentially reorient pieces that might have repeats in it so we can span repeats this way. Anyway, this process is called assembly. There's probably 50 different assemblers out there that have been written. Um, keep improving slowly over time, but they all work more or less in the same way where you've got these short reads, you try to align them, you can do that alignment many different ways, but try to create long contiguous blocks from the short reads, okay? And you end up with stuff that looks like this, okay? Um, this is an entire genome of a very small organism called uh, Buchnera. Um, it has about 600 genes. It's a highly reduced form of E. coli that lives in all of our guts. It happens to live in aphids. And there's a whole other talk where I, will ver I would verge off and talk to you all about this organism and why it's cool and how aphids use it. And in fact, it's co-evolved with the aphid over about 80 million years. And the aphid has lost certain biochemistry that the bug takes care of and so forth. But it's sort of a lesson for what's going on in your gut, which is you have, on the average, about 2,000 species of bacteria in your gut that are helping you digest what you just ate, right? and convert things like vitamins into, uh, or raw materials into vitamins that your body can't actually synthesize. And so we've co-evolved with these organisms for as long as humans have been around, because the bugs have been around for a lot longer. But we, we get this out of the assembler, and we want to understand it. And for that, we've built pipelines, what we call pipelines. They're, in some sense, think of them as workflows, big, clunky data flow, kinds of diagrams um, where we have uh, various tools kind of arranged in a series. In this case here, we would start with the sequencing effort assembly, then we would go through a process of trying to predict features that we've seen before in that sequence, give it some, some markers, and then we would try to recognize the things that we've seen before that we've identified functions with. That process is called annotation. And then we start comparing what we see in this new organism to all the other organisms that we see in the past that might be related and uh, work out some comparative analysis, contribute new members into things that we're keeping track of, like protein families and so on, and move towards evolutionary analysis or whatever we're trying to do. And uh, what it means is that you end up from that raw sequence like this into a maybe a conceptual thing like this where you've marked out there's a gene and it codes on the strand in this direction, it's of this length. This color here might correspond to a function. And you can sort of build up from that. You can uh, do this multiple sequence alignment where you're aligning across many different organisms, uh, similar regions in the chromosome to try to understand how much function is conserved, how much structure is conserved, how much has evolution uh, uh, moved things around in time. Each one of these, uh, what we call an open reading frame, codes for a protein sequence, this is a protein alignment giving us the history at a much finer level of how the protein changed over time. This translates into a structure that's actually doing the work in your cell, right? And then we can do evolutionary trees, okay? So from that single sequence, we can build up all of this machinery through a couple dozen tools that have been developed over the last 30 years, right? And one of our tasks in high-performance computing applied to this is how can we scale this up so we can run this on hundreds or thousands of genomes or tens of thousands or millions of genomes, right? And do the comparative steps that are looking across 
many, many genomes. So that's how we get a big computing problem out of, say, analyzing small organisms. But there's more. So this is a great quote from Leonardo da Vinci, 1500. Right? We know more about, well, I, can, I used to have it memorized, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than we do about the soil underfoot. Right? And that's sort of interesting. In 1500, of course, you had astronomers. The science was astronomy. It was up. Right? If you compare the state of astronomy in 1500 to the state of agriculture in 1500, you know what he was talking about. Right? They didn't really understand how plants worked, how soil worked, anything about that. Right? We started looking at the bacteria that live in soil. A single milliliter of soil, right? You probably got, I don't know, 200 milliliters in that glass, right? So one two hundredth of what's in that glass. Each of these milliliters contains about a billion bacteria cells, probably from about 20 to 30,000 different species in one milliliter of soil, right? You can multiply that up for a kilogram here. Um, kilo, whoops, kilogram, you know, 10 to the 13th cells, right? The vast majority of these things, we've never been able to grow them because we don't understand what they need to grow on. It's like being a farmer but not knowing what fertilizer to give it, right? Um, if we scale this up to the whole earth, um, taking into account a fraction of Earth's surface that's land versus the density of things on land and how deep and the density of ocean and blah, 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 blah. You get about 10 to the 30th. If you compare this to stars in the galaxy, it's about 10 to the 11th. So we have about a million times more bacterial cells on Earth than there are stars in the Milky Way, which is kind of cool, right? Um, so, you know, da Vinci sort of had it right here. Um, and, of course, microbes, unlike animals and plants to first order, are responsible for the fundamental life processes on the planet. They recycle the atmosphere. They recycle most of the carbon. They recycle most of the phosphorus, most of the sulfur, nitrogen, and so on. And yet we basically, this is unknown. We talk about the dark matter. We don't mean dark matter up there. We mean dark matter down here, which is this 99% right, that we can't actually cultivate, and so we only have one way to know them. Well, here's the questions we want. How, how many kinds are there? Where do, what, how are they distributed on Earth? Right, we don't know this. Right? We estimate that there's maybe a billion different kinds of species, but we don't know. The estimate ranges from 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 15th, okay? Pretty, Pretty broad uncertainty, 10 orders of magnitude, right? It's, it, man, it's, it's 2014, right? And we don't know the, this within a couple, you know, within uh, four or five orders of magnitude. Um, how do they get distributed around the Earth? So where are they? You know, soil, ocean, your gut, whatever, right? Where do they come from? The Earth is covered with this stuff, right? There's a theorem out there called everything is everywhere the environment selects. What does that mean? This is, this is a basic theorem in microbiology. What it means is that over a period of a few thousand years, every single square meter on Earth is exposed essentially to every single species of microbe. The reason that every single species of microbe is not growing on every square meter of Earth is because not every square meter of Earth has the same environmental conditions, right? But if you create a sterile place, say, on a pedestal in your backyard, Okay, sterilize, I don't know, you know, cubic meter of soil and put it up. It would be a great summer project, right, for next summer, right? Sterilize this cubic meter of soil, put it up on a, you know, pedestal 10 meters up in the air, sample it every week, right? What you'll find is that over time it gets more and more diverse. Pretty soon it'll look just like the soil underneath. Everything is coming into it from rain, from dust, from birds flying over and doing droppings and from insects flying and dying and everything. It's just getting accumulated. So, so microbes move around the earth, um, and they don't just live by themselves. They talk to each other biochemically, signals, and so forth. So we want to know this stuff. So we have these projects that go out and just gather up stuff out of the environment, soil, right? If you're, if 
you're stuck in the Midwest, we go get soil. If you live down in Florida, you get to go swim down and uh, play in the reefs, right? Or if you're living out in Kamchatka or Yellowstone, you get to dig in the hot springs. If you live out in the vineyard lands, they go and dig up, you know, we have a project scooping bacteria off of grapes. It's such hard work because they go get to, and so forth, right? Um, inside the guts of insects, in the anal canal of a lizard. Okay, that one's really fun. Um, <laughs> But anyway, all over the world, okay, collecting this stuff. And then we run it right through the sequencers just like we were doing it before. We've extracted the DNA, not, now not from the mush we ground up in the blender, but from the soil or the uh, you know, feces out of a lizard, right? And now we then sequence it just like everything else, except now it's all mixed up, right? So instead of having, you know, the uh, simple pipeline, now we're in this what we call a metagenomic, which because it's, it's, it's a collection of genomes, and our problem is how do we deconvolute it, right? So we get these sequencing, we do some quality control, we try to clean the reads, we might try to phylotype it, that is look at subsequences that only occur in certain parts of the tree of life, we try to bin it, maybe we try to assemble it, and then we, from this point, we try to do the same thing we were doing before. So the problem here now looks like this, okay? Instead of having just a little bit of these things on the ground, you've got warehouses full of it. Because when you do one of these metagenomics runs, a single data set is on the order of a terabyte of data. <laughs> and we've got, last count, about 13,000 of these data sets. So now this is big data. And we're, what we're trying to do is mine it to pull out as many of these organisms as we can and then use advanced modeling to reconstruct them and say, what is the biochemistry going that this guy can do? How is he talking to his neighbor? What is he doing that his neighbor is not doing that might imply some, some uh, ecological interactions? So we had to build a, uh, a highly parallel engine to do this. Um, the tool that uh, uh, Fang Fang Zia, uh, uh, who's uh, at least now a staff member at Argonne, but he was formerly one of my grad students and postdocs, um, and one of our new students, Chris Bunn, um, and uh, Sebastian uh, Lasso, um, are working on this. And this is a, an assembler specifically aimed at these metagenome assemblies, right? It's high performance in C, it uses MPI, it runs on Mira, it runs at scale. We can load all of these many terabytes of data into RAM on the machine, right? It uses most of the nodes actually to build very fast hash tables across the machine so that we can find small uh, patterns uh, in parallel to do the assembly. Um, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, we've got lots of playing with it. It's named after uh, Kiki the movie, Miyazaki movie. You guys know this movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. You know it, right? Yeah, so Jap one of the greatest, you know, he's like the Japanese Walt Disney, only way better. Um, and uh, Kiki is this witch who has to go live on her own when she turns 13, has a great adventure. Um, but the reason we call it this is the, in the movie, it's called Kiki's Delivery Service. You have to watch, go home and watch, find this movie <laughs> on iTunes and watch it. You gotta watch it, but she has to, she comes up with this thing called Kiki's Delivery Service. I won't tell you any more about it, but we think of this as Kiki Assembly Service. That was, and we think of it a little bit more to, drive the analog into the ground, is that this represents reads, and this represents the contiguous sequence out the other end. That's her cat, that's a real pain in the butt. Um, so this just gives you a sense. So we're now assembling these genomes, but now instead of doing it for a single organism where we know the parts all should fit together, we don't know the parts should fit together, because it could come from different organisms, right? It makes the problem a lot more interesting. Um, this is some stuff on hashing, we can, talk, we can talk about this later. Okay, one more thing before I'm done, you can hit me with some questions. So these are two things, microbes and environments, okay? And we care about these because microbes, you know, make our beer, they make our air, they make us smell, right? <laughs> they make us happy, make us sad. Um, but we also care about human genomes. And one of the interesting things about humans is that we're very similar to each other, right? We're all the same species, mostly, <laughs> right? Um, 
Everybody has a little bit of Neanderthal in them. Um, not everybody, some people do. Um, because we're very similar, once we've sequenced a few tens of human genomes, we figured this out, it means that, of course, we want to sequence the whole genome because we're still trying to understand uh, how much of the functional part of the genome that codes for proteins and so on matters versus how much of the part of the genome that doesn't code for proteins matters, so-called junk DNA or dark DNA, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we know what matters, we just don't know exactly how it matters. Um, but we want to study how variation relates to things like disease, right? And there are many, many complex diseases that are not the result of one genetic change but some combination of genetic changes, right? If it's one genetic change, these are diseases called Mendelian diseases, right? Things like sickle cell anemia is an example like this. There's one single nucleotide polymorphism, there's one base pair flip in somebody that has sickle cell, and that causes sickle cell. And you can recognize it, you can actually, you know, write down the equation that looks for that one pattern, and you can immediately simply detect if somebody had that disease. Most diseases are not Mendelian. Most genetic diseases are complex diseases. Um, and uh, one that um, I'll talk more about a bunch of these, but um, one of the points in this part of the talk is that we ultimately want to be able to scale this up to, you know, millions and millions of genomes with enough resolution so that we can get at rare diseases, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, let's look at uh, a set of diseases that um, you've all heard about. But first, let me take a pause here. So around the time when the first Human Genome Project was closing, uh, remember there were two efforts. There was the NIH-funded effort, or global kind of agency-funded effort, and there was the private effort. Craig Venter was doing it privately, had raised a bunch of money for a company called Solera that was racing to do this with whole shotgun technology, and in fact is the same strategy that I'm talking about that we were using for assembling the metagenomes. But of course, back then he was trying to use it to assemble the first human genome, whereas the public agency-funded genome program was being very methodical and not doing the shotgun approach. They were using markers, and every piece was carefully mapped out, and that's why it cost $3 billion. Um, but around 2001, before, about six years before the genome was finished, Eric Lander, who runs the Broad Institute, who's a mathematician, by the way, not a biologist, um, Eric thought that it would be possible, theoretically, to do what was called genome-wide association studies. And the idea was, and you have to understand how crazy this was at the time. We were still six years away from having one human genome. He said, well, let's say we had 10,000 human genomes, okay? <laughs> and we measured, we, we carefully chose this 10,000 such that approximately 5,000 had some disease we were interested in, and the other 5,000 carefully were chosen to not have the disease, right? Then we could do a statistical analysis where you would look for the correlations of specific differences in the genome between those two cases that would discriminate between those two cases across the entire genome. Since you didn't know what you were looking for, you're trying to have this pattern emerge from the data on its own. Okay, that's called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. Got a great name, GWAS, GWAS. Okay, so they wrote this paper, it's a theory paper, beautiful paper, mathematical paper. Six years later, there was a couple of genomes sequenced and by then people had figured out we don't have to sequence the whole genome, we can just look for places that where we think the genome varies and get almost the same statistical power. By 2013, right, essentially 12 years after this paper, there were 1,700 published studies using this method, okay? That was pretty, pretty cool. Now, back to diseases. There's four that we've been looking at, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diabetes, and autism, okay? All of these are complex diseases. We don't know how they work. We don't really have effective treatment for at least the first two, right? Um, we actually don't have any treatment for this one either. This we've got sort of, uh, you know, palliatives essentially. Together these things make up about, I don't know, $400 billion, $500 billion worth of cost in the healthcare system. Um, and what's next to these is the number of GWAS studies that have been done over the last four or five years trying to get at the genetic basis of these diseases. 
And here's how many people have these diseases. Okay? Five million, expected one in three by 2030 will have some form of Alzheimer's. We don't know why. Diabetes, of course, is going out of control. Autism is pretty high. So the current GWAS methods, when we apply these, I mean, so we talked about sequencing before. Let me just give you the algorithm here. You get the human data. You map it against the reference genome because humans are very similar, so you can do that. You line them up, and you essentially look across the genomes, or across the reads within each genome, across many genomes, and you look for uh, a place where you have variation, where the reference genome has one base pair, but your reads are voting against that base pair, saying it's not a G, it's a C or something. And you accumulate these statistics, okay, and you do it for thousands of genomes. Once you have those statistics, which you get by running a very complex pipeline, which I'll come back to in a second, you end up with a plot that looks like this. So it's called a Manhattan plot, right? You've seen these in statistics. How many people have seen Manhattan plots before? Okay. All right, in statistics, right? So it's supposed to be Manhattan because it's a skyline, right? And what this is here is the essentially the likelihood of this position on the chromosome, this locus, being associated positively with the trait we're interested in. So peaks correspond to potential places where this genetic variation is somehow correlated with the disease phenotype. So these peaks all have names associated with basically the gene that they're found in or the nearest gene that they're found in. And there was a recent study, and this was interesting because it was, some of you may have heard about it on NPR back last November, right? How many people remember, remember every NPR story they've ever heard, <laughs> right? So last November, it was, I don't know, November 8th or something. No, it was a little bit earlier than that. Um, this study was announced, and the interesting thing was that um, they didn't do any new sequencing in this study. What they did is they data mined all the data from the previous Alzheimer's studies, okay? They combined it all together and said, look, look, Ma, more data means more statistical power. So they combined all that data again and re-ran it, okay, with a little bit more sophisticated statistics and out popped 11 new candidates for genes associated with, in this case, Alzheimer's, and um, they were located in some interesting parts of the biochemistry. So, the point is that these kinds of studies get more and more power the more individuals' data you have. Right now, the biggest ones are somewhere around this 50,000 level. The next few years, we're going to be able to do this in 100,000, maybe a million. And then the really interesting computational problem starts to happen, which is each one of these locations right now is considered independently. But of course, what we want to do is test for combinations. And if you do the combinatorics, you immediately should get scared because you can't actually do this, right? We've got on the order of a million different places where there's genetic variation is known. And you start doing a million times a million times a million, you have to be something smarter than that. And that's a problem you guys are going to have to figure out. This is where you take all these studies that were done as of November of last year and place them on the genetic map on a human. What you see is that the entire genome is covered with things that cause disease, <laughs> right? And of course, it shouldn't be surprising because evolution, in fact, you know, doesn't care about the genome after you've basically raised children and you're on the way out. Your genome can go to hell, right? You're, you're, right? So, so this is just uh, normal, except that it's, it's interesting that it is all over the place, and this wouldn't have been possible to know this except through massive sequencing and massive computing, right? And there's still much more that we have to do here. Let me give you an example of what you guys have been talking about this week um, that would immediately help on something like this. So I skipped over this, but if we went here to this pipeline, there's a step in here, basically, um, where we're calling the um, genetic variations, okay? And one of the tools that's most widely used for this is called GATK, Genome Analysis Toolkit. And it's written in Java. Okay, everybody laugh right now, ha, 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 Java. 
Okay, so that code, that piece of code, which is the core bottleneck of this kind of analysis, um, on a typical genome runs about this much time, right, 10,000 seconds. If you immediately recoded that in C++ or C, you get about a factor of 9, 10 in speed up, okay? And then here was a whole bunch of experiments that were done trying to accelerate this code even more, okay? Running it on an FPGA accelerator, got 13x, right? On a single Xeon core using the vector unit, 35x. Bunch of experiments on, Excel, on uh, GPUs, right? Ranging from 35 to 67x. And then finally this experiment that was done on a 24 core um, Xeon using the 500 bit, the prototype 500 bit vector accelerator and got a whopping 700x improvement in speed, right? So this suddenly becomes, goes from a huge bottleneck to something that's, oh, it's not real time, but getting a factor of 700 just by doing some clever, not stupid coding, right, is, is a huge win, but also shows you the power and the challenge of actually doing, you know, highly optimized code. This is still, of course, uh, not running in parallel in a sense, I mean, it's running on a single node, but essentially on 24 cores and parallelized at the vector level, run, scaling this up to, I don't know, 100,000 nodes would now make this, uh, you know, really amazingly fast, right? So, what can I say? There's a challenge here. One thing that's going on is that as the data volumes increase, we keep changing algorithms. So we started out with algorithms that were kind of order n squared for doing comparisons until we had too much data to where those algorithms didn't work anymore. We moved to algorithms that were sort of n log n uh, algorithms. So those didn't work anymore. Now we're moving to sort of constant or towards sort of order n algorithms, sort of streaming class algorithms now to basically algorithms that are more or less running in constant time because they're computing statistics about the underlying object and doing all the comparisons in statistical space. So over a period of about 20 years, the workhorse algorithms in biology have shifted dramatically and will keep shifting towards faster and faster methods trying to keep up with not just the volume of data but the fact that we have so many more instances of the data that we actually want to compare things for. I think I'll stop there. Um, lots of people work on this um, and uh, lots of people pay for it. And uh, there's Mira. Uh, you can all worship it now. Hello. <laughs> and uh, there's someday we will get to this point and we'll see the new world, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Any questions for Rick? I'm just curious, in the very beginning, you showed the, the slide of. of um, I guess kind of like CPU power and, and hard drive storage and things like that, and then how you're able to collect this data. How does networking fit into this? Networking fits into it. Um, there's a more interesting plot that compares the aggregate uh, kind of built-up capacity in storage, compute, networking, and so on. What's interesting in that slide, which is the one I should replace that with, but I didn't have it when I read that piece, is that the rate at which we're generating data from sensors, which sequencing is just an example of that, is even exceeding the rate of expansion of networking. So what that tells me, it's exceeding the rate at which we're accumulating compute, not just individual processors, but the total accumulation of compute, exceeding the rate at which we're accumulating storage and exceeding the rate at which we're growing networking to connect things together. It means, essentially, eventually, we're gonna have to have hierarchical processing. We're gonna have to put processors where the data is being collected such that just like your nervous system works, right, you collect a lot of information in your retina, but you transmit very little of it to the brain, right? We're gonna have to put processing closer to the sensors. That leads you to, I would say, a theorem about Internet of Things that maybe you guys aren't thinking about yet, but as we go forward in time, there will be more and more reason to put more and more intelligence close to the sensors. So in order to make the universe make sense, in the future, remember the future is not stupid, right, by design, right, except it is often, but it's our job to fix it. So things like a sequencing machine would actually have a computer inside it 
as close as possible to those image detectors such that what comes out is like assembled sequence. So that's the future. And so if you want to start a genome sequencing company with that idea, business model, <laughs> I'll sell it to you. <laughs> what else? So <laughs> one of the things is that we, I thought one of the big lessons I thought we'd learn from like getting so much genetic information is learning that knowing somebody's DNA doesn't only tells you like some it, it's it's not the whole story like that expression and environment sure have incredible impacts on right. what actually comes out so right. is there some sort of like like follow on computation I, problem I was, it was a huge problem so let, let, let's I'll just riff on that for a minute right so you have about 200, 300 cell types in your body, okay? Each cell type in your body has turned off some genes more or less permanently. That's why we're not all stem cells walking around, right? And so that means that in each tissue type, genes are differentially expressed. And so when we're doing these genome-wide association studies, we're looking at the base genome. We're not actually looking at just the genomes that are expressed in certain types of tissue. So not only are you guys going to be sequenced more than once your base genome, but you're probably going to have dozens and dozens of gene expression snapshots taken under different conditions. If you're sick, if you have a tumor, right, you want to get the gene expression pattern of that tumor because it will tell you the kind of cancer it is and the specific mutations that took place that differentiates that tumor from the healthy cell. So we can then figure out how to treat that particular tumor, right? So the base genome is just the start. Everything gets built up on top of that. It'll be a thousand times more than just the base genome. And that's cool because we'll keep selling storage devices and big computers, right? Anything else? No? Can't wait to get back upstairs and hack? <laughs> So you mentioned about the approach of like top to down approach, right? Is that what's the status of the other one? Like people try to create the genome. You mean trying to like create synthetic life from the bottoms up? So, uh, well, a few years ago, uh, Craig Venter's company, um, Ham Smith and a few others, had uh, built an artificial chromosome that was a copy of a. Uh, Mycoplasm genitalia genome. So it was a pretty small genome, about less than a million, less than a million base pairs, less than a thousand genes. And they did it by, you know, essentially looking at what nature had come up with, and then uh, knowing the uh, active part of the genome and the intergenic regions. They basically synthesized longer and longer pieces of DNA and glued it together to make a synthetic chromosome. And then they booted it up in a cell of which they ripped out the DNA. Okay, so that's already happened about you know, four or five years ago. That wasn't really creating life because they started out with a cell that was already alive and ripped the genome out and put a new one in and let it grow long enough to where <clears throat> more or less all the parts have been replaced right over time, just like the old philosophical story about you know a boat. If I got a boat, I systematically replace each part of the boat. Do I have the same boat when I'm done, right? Well, this organism had grown through, I don't know, 50 generations to where statistically there was no item still alive in that cell that was in the mother cell, right? So that then was an artificial organism, but it wasn't booted up from nothing, right? That process of synthetic genomics is making headway. We can now synthesize longer and longer pieces of DNA. That's both a cool thing and sort of a scary thing um, because, you know, you can take something like a polio vi you know, virus um, that we've more or less eradicated, except for in Afghanistan, and um, uh, put it away in the freezer, right? But we still have the sequence in the database. You can go to the lab, recreate the DNA for that, stick it in a cell, we'll make a virus, right? So we will have the ability to both read DNA and synthesize DNA. We also have the ability then to change things, right? So I didn't talk at all about engineering, but a huge part of what uh, we're trying to do in DOE in biology is actually build the infrastructure that allows you to engineer things. So to move a biochemical pathway from this organism to this one, you want to build <clears throat> something that uh, you know makes biofuel really well. Well, you want to go into various environments where you find bacteria that naturally degrade, you know, wood or cellulose from various environments. Take the enzymes out of those guys and stick them into the 
the bacteria that you can grow in a reactor so it's much more efficient, right? Or stick the pathway from two different bacteria, one that does five carbon sugar and one, you know, six carbon sugars, um, and stick them in the same bug so it can do both, it can digest both, or whatever. So you can combine things together. I still think we're pretty far away from booting a cell up from nothing, but it will probably happen in our lifetime. There's, as in, you know, there's lots of academic thinking around how to do that. Um, and we can do things that we call um, in vitro expression systems. So I don't have time to talk about this in detail, but you know, a cell basically is a container that has uh, enzymes in it, right, that know how to make things. And one of the things they know how to make is more DNA and more proteins and so forth, right? And so I can stick instructions into that cell that will make something. Well, we know how to make something that functions like that in this without any cells in it. We put the RNA in it, we put the enzymes in it, we put the raw materials in it, we can crank out stuff, right? We just can't do this fast enough and stick it into something small enough to boot up a cell from non-biological sort of beginnings at the moment. But probably within 10 or 15 years we'll be able to do that. Then it's just limited by your imagination. Right? Evolution was going pretty slowly up until now, when we can now start applying, you know, intelligent design. Okay. Thank you, Rick.